Hello and welcome to Senior Moment. My name is David Refson. I am your host. Um, with so many uh, seniors living in the Valley, it's no wonder they decide to both live here and retire here. There are many, many things to do. But I should just preface that the show is about seniors and for seniors. There are so many artists, writers, and musicians uh, who are seniors who live in the Valley and it's a great place to have seniors get involved in those activities. We are very honored to have with us Jacqueline Sheehan. She is a noted Valley author. And our book, Lost and Found, has been on the New York Times bestseller list now. And we're happy to have her here. So I wanted to talk to Jacqueline a little bit about how she made this transition from being a clinical psychologist to being a writer of many novels. Yeah, well, David, for me, it's just a perfect transition. And really, everything that I learned as a psychologist um, applies to writing. You know, all my years as a psychologist, really, if someone came to me into my uh, therapy practice, it was because something was not going well in their life. And my job was to find out, a little bit like a mystery, what's not working? What usually works for you? How can we, what's the conflict? What's the hurdle that you're facing? And you know, what motivates you? And what, what matters to you? And you know, what would you go to the mat for? And those are all things that I have to know about a character. Um, but I had always liked writing. I just couldn't figure out, prior to becoming a psychologist, how the heck to make a living at it. Right. Yeah, I had done journalism in New Mexico, um, but you know, really the, the pay was so small, it was just ridiculous. So my second love was psychology. Um, and then I began writing quite seriously when I was a psychologist and I would wake up at five in the morning when my daughter was still in school and write for an hour or two before I would commute to Westfield State College. And um, every snow day, every holiday, um, I would write. I would imagine it takes an enormous <laughs> amount of discipline and patience to be a writer. Because it's not like you're writing one page. You're writing hundreds <laughs> of pages. And well, you are always just writing one page. If right. I thought I had to write 80,000 words, that would be overwhelming and I would of just course. go run screaming out of the room. Right. But if I knew that I had on this day to write a scene, if I had to get Cooper from the back of a pickup truck onto a ferry over to Portland, I could write that and that would be a scene and I'd, I'd be good. But it, it really had to get down to kind of manageable chunks. I don't know if there's something <laughs> typical, but how long does it typically take you to write a novel or is there not a typical... Oh scenario for that? that? You know, there doesn't, for me, there doesn't seem to be anything typical. My very first novel was historical fiction. I was working full time. It took five years. Um, this next book, uh, Lost and Found, took about two years. And I think if I averaged out, it would be a little over two years for each book, depending upon the amount of research. Now, you have done mm -hmm. uh, many mm -hmm. different types of books. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, historical fiction with mm -hmm. Sojourner Truth. Yeah. Uh, we talked about Lost and Found here, uh, which is about a dog and a woman and their relationship. Mm -hmm. And then there was Center of the World, which yeah. had to do with a girl trying to find out about her adoption and what, how that yeah. happened. I, I mean, I go through a day and I'm sitting in a car sometimes and I say, you know, that's a great idea for a novel, and it lasts about mm -hmm. two seconds until next week, and I come up with another one. Yeah. So how do you pick your topics? So how does that go so you have a, a sense of this is what mm -hmm. I want to write mm -hmm. about? It, so when you're driving and you think to yourself, wow, that's a terrific idea for a story, do you forget it? Do you let it go? Oftentimes I let it go oh, because okay. I don't see myself right. as a writer per se. Yeah. I mean, everybody, everybody thinks they have a novel, right. I, you know? Yeah. And so I don't see myself in that regard. And, uh -huh. But maybe as I become older and as a senior, that might change. Yeah. So I have sort of a backlog of those, you know, and I've, I've always, you know, walking down a sidewalk, um, I do a lot of athletic things. Uh, when I'm walking, when I'm hiking, I am always thinking about a story. 
Um, and most of the time, I can kind of file it away. So I'm never without material uh, to write about. And um, for example, with Lost and Found, I mean, you said it was about a dog and a woman, and it is. But it's also really about the very strange ways that we handle grief when a loved one dies. And that was very much a part of my life. My father died when I was nine, so it made a huge stamp on me. Um, and with my clients, you know, every single person who lost a loved one dealt with it in an entirely different way, ways that I could not imagine. And, and that was part of the motivation for me writing this book. Sure. Uh, part of interest to me about Center of the World, too, since I have two adopted children, yeah. was this whole idea of kind of really what's going on, where I came from. Yeah. And, and obviously there's a lot more to it than that because uh -huh. she, she sets out on a journey to find out what's really going on in mm -hmm. terms of, of her adoption. So I was very fascinated by that. Mm -hmm. uh, did you actually travel to uh, Guatemala? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have been traveling to Guatemala since 2006, um, always going to the same location. It's in the uh, Mayan highlands uh, around Lake Atitlan. And there's one village in particular where I've come to know people, and it's uh, called Santa Cruz La Laguna. And um, so as I got to know the Mayan people and some of their history, and the terrible civil war that they had yes. for 35 years that unfortunately the United States has so many fingers in that a particular war. And um, a war breeds adoption because there are death and there are orphans. And at, for a, a long time that there was just a river of kids being adopted in the uh, United States and some European countries out of Guatemala. And um, some of these were acts of desperation, some were mistakes, uh, some um, were very uh, successful adoptions, but it did run the whole gamut. Um, and I became really fascinated by this. That door has since pretty much closed solid now. Um, the, the country um, is doing better in many ways. So that, that, that river of adoption does not exist so much. Well, that actually is true about most of the countries now where adoption yeah. is getting more difficult to, yeah. uh, to do now for folks. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one time, you're right, it was open within a lot of countries and now the doors have closed mm -hmm. a lot. And mm -hmm. that's kind of unfortunate for the children who would want to be adopted and have a better home here. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of unfortunate, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the, the idea of being on the New York Times bestseller list. We've mm -hmm. talked about this for a minute. Yeah. But h how did this kind of come about? You wrote your, your novel. Oh, gosh. And what happened there? Yeah. That? So the, I wrote, the first book that I wrote had very modest sales. And I thought, well, that's what being a writer is. Sure. You work your butt off for five years. You, you know, you, you get an agent, you finally get a publisher, you're rejected so many times, and then the sales are modest. And I assumed the same thing was going to happen uh, with this book. And um, partly what happened, when, when I first realized that something was happening with this book, I got a call from my sister. And I think the book came out in April, and she called me around Mother's Day, and she said, did you really publish this book? Because I can't find it anywhere. And so I thought, you know, I'm Irish and I have a dismal outlook on life, so I just thought the worst had happened, so I called the publisher. And I said, Carrie, what's gone wrong? Because the book is not out there. And she said, it's not out there because we can't keep it on the shelves. I said, you're kidding. You are kidding me. You know, it's that one moment that you think will never quite happen to you, and then it does. But... Um, it has sold about a half a million copies. Wow. And many more with international sales and um, CDs and so forth. It was just a book that caught people. There was something about it that really uh, caught people. It's, it's, it's a, a somewhat simple book in some ways, um, but it appealed to people who experienced that pang of loss 
and it mattered to them that someone else knew what that felt like, mm. I think. Uh, one of the things we just talked about before we went mm -hmm. on the air was this idea of being stamped, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So it was on the bestseller list for two weeks. I had another book that was on the bestseller uh, list for one week. But here's the thing. Once you are on the New York Times bestseller list, you are forever tattooed New York Times bestselling author. You, you just get to keep it. And that, that's kind of on here, too. If you take a look at, uh, yeah. at the book here, the top of the thing says New York Times bestseller. So yeah. that's kind yeah. of interesting. So does that make it easier for you now to sort of get either published or people interested in your book because of this? The publishing world is this wild, it's the, like the wild, wild west. Wow. It is constantly changing. Um, how people read is constantly changing. The length of a book that people are willing to read is constantly changing. You know, we've all sort of had this adult acquired ADD now, <laughs> where, you know, if, if our paragraph is longer than three sentences, our mind starts to wander. Um, so it is not always easier um, it, to find the same uh, readers, for example, that were captivated by this book. They might not at all be captivated by another book. But does, does it uh, give you sort of a, an in, so to speak, with publishers? It who does say, help. Right here, well, sure. if you did this, so, yeah. you know, We'd like to take let's a look at Let's hope you can do it again. Well, let's hope you can do it again, and <laughs> right. hopefully the next book is, is going to do that, yeah. which, is, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, I know you have mm -hmm. some book in the pipeline, so to speak, at this point, or something that you're working on right now? Yeah, I don't know how much I want to talk about it, because it is you know, pretty malleable at this point. Okay. But um, I am working on a book that is, uh, a, a I guess you would call it historical fiction at this point, the two timelines, but the most compelling timeline is 1938 America, when the American Nazi Party um, was really gaining mm. some traction in the United States. It sure was, yes. You know, and we did not have foreknowledge of what was to come. We just did not know that that storm was going to hit with Hitler as, as horribly as it did. So here's this American Nazi party kind of gaining traction in the United States. And some people were trying to raise the red alert. And other people were just saying, you know, well, you know, we have a lot of different political parties. We have socialists, we have communists, and I guess we have Nazis. Yeah, it's, it, it, I don't want to say it, it, it went mainstream, but in some small regard, it yeah. did. Mm -hmm. There were rallies, there were even marches, and so on and so Madison forth. Madison Square Garden. Right. Yeah. So there was a big interest in that. Yeah. And uh, there were some people who were sounding the alarm. Yes. I mean, certainly one of them was Winston Churchill, and he realized yep. as he became prime minister later on that this was a real threat yep. to our country. And I wonder if uh, President Roosevelt realized it at the time, too, to some extent. Uh, there were others like um, uh, Lindbergh who wanted us to stay out and have nothing to do with what's going on there. And that Well, he changed. was quite a right-wing fellow really himself. Was. He really was. Yeah. And that changed rather quickly, by obviously, by 1939, yeah, yeah. when that all happened. So I, I will not ask you further about uh -huh. the book, because it <laughs> sounds like you're in the process of mm -hmm. writing. Uh, one of the things that uh, I didn't mention before, but I want to certainly talk about now, mm -hmm. is that you are one of the founding members of a group called Straw Dog Writers Guild. Uh -huh. Yes. So uh, tell me how that got started, why it got started. And I noticed when I went on to look on the website, I noticed there were a lot of folks, senior folks, who were writers and writing mm -hmm. various, whether mm -hmm. it's poetry or whatever they're doing. So right. how did that get started? Yeah, it was started by a group of about uh, six or seven of us in uh, 2010. We got together at Patricia Lee Lewis's house in West Hampton because we were all thinking the same thing. We were all thinking, wow, look, there are so many incredible writers in this valley, you know, in western Massachusetts. Why can't we develop an organization that would support us a little bit more, that would... Um, you know, that if you wrote a book, I could help you promote it a little bit. I could put a spotlight on you. Um, if you're a brand new writer and you're trying to um, improve your writing skills, maybe we've got a workshop for you. Um, and writers like to be with each other. Sure. So um, 
we began uh, pretty small and um, I think today we have uh, about 250 uh, paying members. It's a, a paid organization, uh, but you don't have to be a member in order to get on the uh, newsletter. And the newsletter now is monthly, and it's just brimming with events that happen in the Valley, absolutely brimming with events. Well, well let me ask you this. So I'm a new writer. Mm -hmm. I've never written before, and now I decide I wanted to get involved. Yep. There are actually workshops to help me sort of both either get started mm -hmm. or ideas of how to proceed if I want to become a writer yeah. and what that's all about. Is yeah. that something that's... Yeah, that's, that, a, that's absolutely true. Um, so Straw Dog Writers offers workshops at Lilly Library, Northampton Center for the Arts. We've expanded now into South Hadley, Turner's Falls. Um, so if you were wondering, wow, how do these people, how do I write dialogue, you know, that you could catch up with a workshop that would at least give you uh, a little taste of, you know, here are some resources for you, here's some examples, here's what dialogue can can do, you know, here this, here's the purpose that it can serve. Now, do you, do you actually teach some of the workshops yourself? Sure, I have, yeah, yeah, and I also teach, um, um, with another organization called Writers in Progress that is run by Dory Ostermiller. Okay. Right, Writers in, Writer in Progress, right. Teach over in Boston mm -hmm. at Grub Street. And also teach workshops uh, very often about for, for about uh, 17 years with Patricia Lee Lewis at international writing retreats in Guatemala, in the UK, in um, Jamaica, where else have we gone? Uh, Ireland, of course. I know yeah. where you're about to go, mm. but I wanted to talk to you a little bit. You had mentioned the fact that there's an open mic once mm. a month. Can you tell me a little bit about yes, that? Yes, yeah. So there are quite a few poetry open mics in, in the Valley. Um, but uh, what, uh, one thing that I started about six years ago is an uh, open mic that is poetry, prose, pretty much anything that you're writing. And it's a two hour event. We currently hold it in um, the basement um, in Northampton, which is right near the police station, okay. you know, just in case writers go crazy, I guess. <laughs> right. And um, at uh, 21 Center Street yeah. uh, in Northampton. So the first hour, um, our, it's an open mic, and if you want to uh, have a chance to read, you put your name in a hat, and if you get to read for five minutes. So you can read anything that you've been working on even a, a research article, prose, poetry, fiction, uh, flash fiction, just about anything. And then uh, after that hour, people can, you know, let you know what they thought. You know, if they loved what you wrote, I urge them, you know, you know tell David you love what he wrote. Well, that, that was my, my next <laughs> thing, because unless you have critique, mm -hmm. how do you know that you're even, that it's okay, that you're hitting in the right yeah. direction, that it's something yeah. worthwhile to continue along that? Mm -hmm. So I assume that's part of what goes on, is this method of critiquing? Not, not at the open mic so much. Right, there just right. really isn't enough time for that. Okay. Um, you know, but, but there are critique groups that do specifically that. And, and I really urge people, once they've got a, a project well underway, a critique group of trusted people with a group that has strong guidelines can just be so valuable. No. And then the second half of the open mic, um, I bring in a featured uh, writer. Oh, so they pretty much have the whole second hour. And this month it was Michael Ponser, who is a uh, federal judge, lives here in right. Amherst, and he has written two mysteries. Interesting. He's terrific. Uh, yeah. Yes, and <laughs> we, we can talk more about him at some point. Yeah. Um, can people just show up anytime they want? Do they have to make appointments? Do they have to schedule time to meet with people? Uh, so um, if you were to look at uh, strawdogwriters.org on the web page, right. there would be a listing of our events, and anyone can attend those events. The, every once in a while there will be a fee. It usually means we have to pay rent someplace, but that will be listed if it's $5 or, or whatever it is. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, you mentioned that you're doing a trip to Prague. Mm, yeah. Can you kind of talk about that a bit? Yeah, so I work with another writer in New Jersey. Her name is Julie Maloney, and we've been working together for about 10 years. And um, 
we decided to set up, mostly Julie setting up, a, um, a writing retreat to Prague. Neither of us have ever been to Prague. Um, and it will be, it's a 10 day writing retreat. Um, about three of those days are in Prague, seven of those days are out at a um, retreat two hours outside of town called, I think, Santa Caterina. And um, if anybody wants to find out more about that, you could go to my webpage, which is jackwillandshean.com, and we'd be so glad to talk with you about that. When you, when you say a retreat, so folks sign up, and these are either uh, people who want to know about writing, who are writers already. Um. Yeah, it is always a wild mix. It is always a mix of people who may have written several books, people who, I remember one person who attended a retreat in Scotland, and you know she was probably about our age, and she had never written, but she had always wanted to, and she said, I have been waiting all of my life for this for just, you know, to, to be willing to give myself this time to be with writers, to write together, to get feedback. Um, so it's a great mix of people. Is there a limit, meaning no more than 10, it's open to? Yeah, there's, always a, um, there's always a space limitation. Right. Um, uh, so I think with Prague, um, that's a, it's quite a bit larger group, so that's 18, um, and I think we're half fall there. And some retreats are smaller, some are just 12. Um, and I think for a workshop size, some of the local workshops, um, um, I think 12 is a great number. Eight is sort of my favorite number. Okay. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about actually what goes on in the retreat? What, what your... The, like the retreat in Prague? Yes. Well, yes. Okay. So um, part of the time is simply, you know, you're being taken care of. Your meals are taken care of. You know, you're not scheduling stuff with your kids. You're not worried about Wonderful. your dog. Yes. You're being cared for. And your only reason for existing at that moment in time is to write. Um, so all of your needs are taken care of. You're in a beautiful place to write. And um, there are times when we all get together in, in smaller groups. Um, and Julie and I will offer a prompt uh, to the group that's usually pretty open-ended that gets people started. Mm -hmm. um, but we always tell people, you know, this is all of your time. This is your time. And if you want to come back and share your writing with us, please do. If you want to keep writing, if you are on a roll, stay with it. Is there any one-on-one -on -one time with these folks? Um, Meaning either you yeah. or whoever else is going to be there? Do you spend individual time yeah. or is that more of a group situation there? It's almost always a group situation. Um, when I work with Patricia Lee Lewis, we always offer um, that people can schedule individual time with us. They could either have handed in a manuscript to us ahead of time or if they just want, you know, 45 minutes to talk with someone about their writing because there there may not be anybody in, else in their life right. who will listen to them talk about <laughs> right, their writing. <laughs> right. right. Now, once, let's say they come with a novel, mm -hmm. just for argument's sake, and you read the novel or they do and you say, well, this is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you help them lead them in a direction to publishers or that kind of part of it or is it just strictly instructional on what writing is or what they've done or how you can help them write. Yeah, that, I mean, if I can, if, um, if an agent comes to mind, if they, if I, if I can, I will do that. But that is pretty much the, the job of the, the writer. You know, if you're writing in a genre that I really have no connection with whatsoever, I am not going to be helpful to you. Right. Um, so, yeah. Um. Really interesting. Uh, do you get a mix of like young and old at a place like Prague, <laughs> or is it mostly older folks? I mean, you've done these workshops before, yeah, so yeah. So have a I sense. would say, um, it, you know, it's uh, it's on a bell curve, and the big part of the bell curve is um, middle aged. I would say forty to 60, 65, right in there. We do get younger people, and we do get older people. I remember. 
at one of our retreats in Guatemala, which is sort of rugged. Yes. I mean, this is, we go to a place where there are no roads. You're walking on right. paths right. from village to village. Right. Um, one of the gentlemen that joined us from Texas was 84 years old. Wonderful. And he loved it, and we loved him. Last question before we need to end. Is it strictly <laughs> like novel? Can they be a poetry person mm -hmm. there who writes? So the genre is kind of open-ended? Yes. That's terrific. Yeah. Jacqueline, this has been really wonderful. I want to thank you very much for being a guest. I'm going to hold this up one more time, folks. <laughs> Lost and Found, New York Times best-selling author and noted Valley writer. Jacqueline Sheehan, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you, you very David. Much.